Hello everyone, today we talk about the rise of the free companies in 14th century Italy. We already made an introductory video about that a couple of years ago. That was dealing in general, if I'm not wrong, about the causes of it. And today we'll look a bit more at, yeah, the thing, right, comprehensively from an economical, if you want, or mostly, of course, military point of view, but stressing a bit what were the at some point the interpretational keys that historiography gave to this phenomenon how it occurred with our you know the, the perspectives now on the same topic because it's not being studied as you may think instead that that much right as I made multiple videos at this point explaining how we haven't really gotten medieval warfare that uh, right comprehensively it's as if historiography had developed for some reasons of you know with this different fields right in times and space about single single countries a certain you know or what of maybe in the same historiographies of those countries have stressed about certain you know that 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 moment let's say um and then kind of stereotyping them on that base but not really confronting them with one another so this topic specifically is one of those that are yet to be dimensioned correctly I believe and that uh, have had the, the opportunity to I, I studied in partly this um, Italian communal armies uh, the German mercenaries of, of in, in this era I think at this point I'm the only person who consistently wrote anything uh, tactical about it um, in in the true sense, like the art of war of of, of the the aspect, and um, that's discomforting <laughs> in a way because it was easier for me. But I realized that still, what is written here is st still not done comprehensively. It's done at very tiny and systematic and structural bits at a time, and we still lack the, the bigger picture. So today we will not digress on the enormity. Of topics that are 14th century, rea I mean, of, of problems in general that that our 14th century reality presents, historically speaking, because they're really big, right? We arrived to the philosophy of history in a way, but um, this is partly the fun of saying. But we will try rather to, in fact, provide that m attempt, and of course, to, to to provide that kind of more, you know, objective. Mm, concrete, um, almost quantitative um, picture of the world. Um, so we already did, I've, I made a video, for example, on um, German mercenarism during the 14th and the 15th century. It was specifically about Germany. It deals a little a bit the same thing today. For Italy, we talk just about the 14th because just what is there that time is too much in one chunk to swallow. But we'll try it in. Uh, and for the 15th we'll see it, of course another time and more videos of course just like all these other topics so um, the free companies right who were they right and first of all why were they formed like w when can we start saying you know this is a free company right so um, historiographically speaking free companies have mostly highlighted from this period in Italian history between the 30s and the 80s of the 14th century. Because these were moments, so starting from the approximation to, to let's say properly what we're talking about, these were um, entire uh, armies right, w that were fundament uh, virtually devoid of any control from the side of local powers. All right, these were yeah basically nuclei of m mercenary companies that glued together that took advantage of the local political instability, fragmentation. They looted around, and they had a living uh, in this fashion. And this is the you know the the, the main idea we have of the f uh, of the free companies all together. And um, generally speaking. Uh, in historical perspective, I would say Italian historiography, especially that is the one that naturally should have uh, addressed the thing more, you know, more consistently in a properly interpretive sense, um, naturally 
stigmatize this period as a form of crisis, right? Which is, and if you look at the date here, as we've seen, this is where in the mid 14th century. So this was indeed a moment of crisis in many ways, Europe wide. Mercenary companies, as you know, were roaming around, not just in Italy, actually. The most famous one, the White Company, came notoriously from from the battlefields of the Hundred Years' War, mostly made of Englishmen, under John Oakwood, we'll see it in a while. Um, so, there are, think about the Great Chevauchet, think about the, um, the general crisis and the shrinking, the withdrawal of the two universal powers, and more in general of all the great powers in Europe, like the, there is a phase of, as we've seen, of properly of splitting and of the, the, with the decline of universalism, the rise of this essentially uh, national, uh, let's say, the consolidation of the so-called national monarchies, in a way, and which was a bloody process, right? It wasn't easy. It wasn't um, to be given for granted, right? But it was an important achievement after all that even this day here the end of it, the 80s of the 14th century that basically doesn't stop the age of the uh, of mercenarism because you know that the condotta lived on right and the condotta hadn't even been born there condotta has to be found since i think any country since the mid 13th century even before so why there is some kind of um uh sometimes in terms of, of confusion, right? Because from the 80s onwards, the Italian powers fundamentally resorted after this phase. It was fundamentally dominated by foreign mercenaries, and that's also why local historiography wasn't, you know, very much post-unitary Italian, you know, um, ideology much in, you know, in favor of the thing of the foreigners, especially having fought against, you know, the you know, uh, occupation of other countries, of other powers. So th this was seen in general as, as bad, Right, and part of the reason why ah, it's all bad, it's not really important, or it was just bad in the first place. So, but not even starting what this thing was actually about in terms of the the control of the same Italian powers and interference they had, and the fact they threw these companies at one another re really were. Um, but from the 80s onwards, they just hire Italians again, which is yet another dynamic that has not been studied properly well. That is to say, after this moment of great fortune. And of even of military efficiency of properly the, the foreign mercenaries, mostly Germans, but also as we'll see other nationalities, French, uh, English, you know, Bretons, uh, etc. Lots of them, right? But here, in fact, even the, the national character is relatively blurred. But indeed, after this, um, the condotte were almost practically all Italian. And this also has not been studied yet, but there is a logic behind it, even intuitively, you, you can understand in this phase. So, um, it is correct what the historiography has already highlighted, that is to say, these uh, free companies uh, affirmed themselves mostly starting from the 20s and the 30s of the 14th century, but however, rather timidly, right, especially at the very beginning. Why do we conceive them as free companies in this regard? I mean, I believe the English um, historiographical term is, 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 is useful, right? It's purposeful because it stresses the, f the freedom of them, right? The, at least, you know, not, not quite, shouldn't be seen in a quite absolute way. But the fact that, yes, these are de facto armies that escape the control of local governments or as it more often happened properly, you know, that would remain without an employer because those governments were not willing to pay them anymore after they had, you know, fulfilled their contract, their, you know, their purpose, right? At this point, considered that there was not such, let's say, that, that advanced, um, structured, formalized control and rule of engagement, and especially on, on a larger scale, probably of, of entire armies, like it would happen in 15th century Italy, when you have properly entire armies that were contracted by a single condottiero that could become even kind of a vassal of that power and so on. At, at this point, especially at the beginning, these companies are literally just the, the many, 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 many companies of, okay, it could be 20, 30, 50, 100, 200, 500 people, right, uh, that were hired and that roamed around. It simply came, right, sometimes the same Italians went to Germany, to France, saying, you know, we want you to come there. Sometimes they were nobility. Well, especially, well, 
more or less everywhere because the the, uh, the the leaders of these companies were mostly aristocrats, right? They were the ones who knew how to make war and they, they made a business out of it. Um, there are interesting dynamics relatively to this. The, you know, in France, the, the, the lower nobility was uh, was hungry of, you know, of employment. They would, they would accept that. Uh, in Germany, the uh, ministerialist class basically by this point is undistinguishable from the other knights, but let's say they, as such, they had lost most of their powers in times of the rise of the princes in Germany and their dynasties that were some you know, towering down at that point. So um, there are demographic dynamics. You, you would be surprised how close, in, in a sense, 14th century Europe was still to the migration era from, uh, according to certain dynamics. Germany, for example, at this point, why the Germans were so prominent, at least one reason why they were, is that Germany at this point reached the same amount of inhabitants of Italy, historically speaking, for the first time. That, that's impressive because this were a lot of people, right? Uh, and they, uh, they, they also lived their crisis, uh, as, as we were saying, mid-14th century. So uh, this, they, they went for where there was more employment, right? Italy was... Uh, richer, it was uh, politically uh, divided, uh, and therefore warfare was all over the place all the time. So they, they, they would naturally, the, this German mercenaries would naturally flow into Italy, even in through dynamics that are not really uh, clear, right? Because aside from the news of this various um, contractors that were sometimes literally called by the same sent you know, with ambassadors from, from say, Italian city-states into uh, Germany, etc. We, we don't, like, that That doesn't count for the, the entirety, right? Because the numbers were massive. We're talking about at least some thousands, right, of, of, of these knights, right? So heavy cavalry uh, in, in Italy at all times. Uh, at this, when you look at the expeditions of Ludwig the Bavarian, of Charles of Bohemia in Italy, they, you understand that these this power fundamentally w w they would enter Italy with a very few uh, a very few troops because they were they didn't they wouldn't have power mostly the, their their enterprise there was paid by the same Italian powers who were fighting against one another in the struggle between Guelphs and Ghibellines etc. and that there were you know, the same Italian city-states had more German knights available than the same German kings coming into the peninsula. So it, it's remarkable by itself. Um, here we should make a premise that uh, starting from the 20s or the 30s or the 14th century, maybe, you know, we can't skip in a sense, but th there have been phases in this, right? The, the actual beginning of, like, German mercenaries, as you know, in Italy had always been around in a way or another. Um, think about since the, the Battle of Civitate or, you know, the, the various Rome fart, the, the, the Swabians in, in, in the peninsula, the mercenaries of Frederick II, of Manfred, etc. But what happens now, as we were saying before, that while, while before those mercenaries were more or less fundamentally under the control of certain monarchs that came into the peninsula, at this point, these people are free. Right by the 14th century, the market is much more developed. Like Europe is much more developed in general, and therefore uh, mobility is and and mass mobility is, is much greater in many ways. Uh, this is all intertwined, as we have explained countless times here. Italy was basically paying for most of properly properly the financial burden of the wars. Um, by subcontracting financially, you know, the, the hiring these mercenaries in places like France, England, you know, they, they use all Lombard, Tuscan bankers for, for that. <clears throat> and they sometimes all contracted also Italian mercenaries, famously enough, the, the French uh, with the um, Genoese uh, admirals and uh, crossbowmen, right? But there, there is more than that, actually, and uh, it's not a dramatic movement from south to north, but the other way around, which tells you also from which direction gold rate, you know, uh, float. So it, it, it is, um, it's not a surprise that all these mercenaries wanted to go to Italy because they paid them handsomely. And in, in this sense, it's, it's beautiful to look at this area because it, it shows, in a way, the cradle properly of a, of a military selection that in other countries on a professional basis, that then in other countries doesn't quite exist as such, right? And this is the uh, 
the 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 exceptional nature of this reality because other countries would have naturally a lot of mercenaries in their employment and however the first mass injection of thousands of transalpine rather than strictly german at that point it would be partly also burgundian flemish french etc in fact there are a lot of synecdoches also in the sources for which you don't quite clearly understand especially you know the burgundians are often uh, mistaken for germans or french because so you know um but the the que the question here is you know that that after the the, the expedition of henry the seventh uh in the first tens of the 14th century that is the you know the last massive military enterprise properly um of, of after the you know the interregnum and of uh, the german emperors the german kings properly because they not coming to Italy that they had not even properly received the imperial title. The first time with Henry VII arrived there and they, when he dies of malaria, when he had collected this huge army, right, some of his mercenaries were actually Italian, uh, but lots of them were German, etc. They, th this bulk of, you know, of troops was coming back north of the Alps, was hired by other Italian powers, chiefly Ghibellines, like the ones that had supported the emperor at that point, namely Pisa. There is a beautiful military history about this that is dramatically overlooked. Uh, a very few people study, but for example, the battles of Montecatini or Alto Pasha or Zappolino technically were. It was some of the most important battles of the early 14th century Europe, but for some reason uh, that is historiographical in nature. Right, it's both, um, uh, say, an Italian and foreign fault because, again, these things must be studied just by the size and the uh, tactical development of these things. These are the single most important things that happened in Europe at the time, military-wise, and s still, they're not studied. They're not studied, and uh, we don't even, you know, we can't even put up an excuse for for, for this, right? And you look at the, the main compendium that, that there are in disclosure in books about medieval warfare, this chapter basically do not quite exist. They skip essentially from the golden age of communal armies, say the time of Legnano against Barbarossa and so on, to the age of the condottieri, right? And th this whole thing in between actually was the moment of greatest military development, probably not just in Italy, but likely probably in, in, the, in, in the entire um, medieval European uh, warfare, and I'm not exaggerating at all, actually, and and that's where you know that we have you uh, we have missed a, a, an enormous elephant in the room that was always there because these battles have always been known histor historiographically speaking. It's just that this makes it even worse, and it tells you how Europeans and, and Westerners do not study their own history seriously. Right, and sometimes it, it, it's so embarrassing. You say, that there is, but there must be some reason. No, there is no reason except properly the niche hyper specialization or uh, lack of comp linguistical competence, whatever. Uh, it's there. It's a massive event. It's massively documented. There, there is not. Any, there's no excuse for keeping it, you know, without. Well, in there you see already the German uh, cavalry, this submercenary cavalry, combined beautifully with the very tactically developed Italian infantries of the time that are even here basically the precursors of what you see later on at the end of the Middle Ages with uh, tens of thousands of pikemen capable of flanking cavalry in open field on a regular basis basically employed in the entire this is not even about communal Italy this is the entire peninsula and even that thing has not been studied right and uh, it's really impressive, right? And the result is astonishing because this tactic fundamentally wouldn't exist. Uh, like, we find it in England after, you know, basically um, six, like 40 years after this is regularly documented in Italy with, you know, the idea, the idea of properly uh, infantry wings uh, regularly systematized, you know, with cavalry in the center and uh, this uh, multiple lines in depth, right? The English actually had only single line and overloaded with longbowmen and, and with a, you know, different numerical ratio of the various arms. This this is something incredible, that is able to maintain for formation, alineation, advancing, having even aggressive use of infantry. There are even even some cases properly, you know, 
infantry charging cavalry. Yes, they're kind of exceptional and not so descriptive of the whole thing, but that tells you, like, try to find something else properly successful in that, in, in the rest of European warfare at that time. And uh, there is very few parallelisms that can be traced. So w why is it important to understand this? Because it, it, it is important to understand why Italians at that point needed this professionals, which in, in practice is, under, is understandable, right? Um, these mercenaries eventually would remain in the peninsula, but they would keep coming. With the mid-14th century, this great um, um, Italian communal capacity of deploying tens of thousands of men on the field, even for single cities, uh, armies, so that gives you also quantitatively a dimension of how, you know, large... Uh, properly from a structural point of view, Italian warfare was at the time. So an army that was normally f fielded as such by the king of, of France could be fielded by a city like Milan or Florence on a regular basis, and even more often, right? And these were single city states with no, pr practically no, no greater uh, land mass in terms of district and territorially speaking. So that's, that, that speaks for itself. Um, and, but the, the crisis of the mid-14th century, the rise of seigneuries, so all an important set of intertwined factors that, however, are deeply connected to war specifically. This tens of thousands of, of especially infantry, shrinks, right? Uh, these were originally citizens plus peasants, and there is all an historiography explaining the decline, the gradual thing. Even this has not been studied entirely satis satisfactorily. Um, but... Uh, I must say, I personally actually did, uh, and I think that that's also why I'm going to to to, to publish this stuff uh, quite quite soon. Probably, you know, it's more than 700 pages, but it, it explains. And there is one track dedicated specifically to German mercenaries. As you know, my master thesis actually was on a German battle at the same time, so I I have always this um, this bias, this this interest for I practically Holy Roman Imperial history and or well I began with migration here but basically that's my thing Italy and Germany most of the times my field of expertise and without digressing too much the outcome of this analysis is fundamentally that especially the German mercenaries so in, in the vest they appear in the peninsula regularly that is the one of heavy cavalrymen because there's virtually no indication no explicit info about the fact that these were, could be German infantry of some sort, right? And this is also meaningful because these are the same years in which the, the Swiss fight against the Habsburgs. Um, there is even in, there actually uh, an Italian involvement through Savoy especially that fought also the major bat in the major battles against the, the, between the Flemish and the Germans. There were lots of, b before I was saying Lud Ludwig of Bavaria, Henry the Seventh before, but also Charles, I mean John and Charles of Bohemia. In the process of there is the there was the Duke of Athens. There there, there is a, there was a, a, a very intense international interaction. So everybody knew actually how uh, Italian warfare was concretely, and when they came there, they fought, they adapted to it without too much too much of a problem. It's just that you understand that that making war at this point was. Uh, you know, th there was no mystery about how other peoples fought in Europe. But if you look at the, for example, the rise of it, of, of um, early 14th century infantries, the Italians wouldn't score any infantry victory as such. But the obvious reason being because they wouldn't need to fight with armies that were composed only by infantrymen, right? Like the the Flemish, for example, um, or the Swiss. So um, that actually doesn't indicate the quality. Of the infantry, and the, the, since in Italy fundamentally cavalry was always there for a reason or another, because the oligarchs had it and they used it, and it would have been foolish not to employ it. And there was always a political interest to fight alongside with the infantry, etc. And there were naturally these foreign mercenaries, and you realize that even actually um, some f nationalities that had contributed to the early 14th century infantry, such as the the Demogalvares, such as think about the Battle of Cephissus. Um, in Greece, from which the same father of the Duke of Athens had been killed, and 
so they knew what it was about, well, these ones would be ousted exactly in the 20s and the 30s. That is to say, one of the uh, recon you know, allegedly more successful infantries in, in medieval Europe, the great mercenaries, the Mughal Bars, the, 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 the Catalan Company, etc. Basically, in this time, there are certain powers, especially Florence after... Uh, after Montecatini states to the Kingdom of Aragon, we don't want to have your troops anymore around. We don't want to even see them around, and and they and they keep hiring uh, German and French mercenaries as heavy cavalry, right? And this is all the more interesting. I promise I will make a video on this. Actually, made a video on the Catalan company that deals a bit with this as well. Also because the Galvares in Italy had been consistent. They were used as garrison troops by the Andrevins all over Guelph, Italy. And um, at a certain point, they simply disappear. They simply disappear, meaning that there were Aragonese, there were Catalans, etc. But as knights, right? In that they weren't a particularly consistent uh, presence. But yeah, they were a substantial minority, but not as infantry. And so this is very fascinating for reasons that we can't even clearly understand, because systemically speaking, uh, we lack even a bit the. Um, Properly, the, the rationalization of this. Like, there is hardly any source that states clearly what they thought of all these changes at the time. But you can see these changes were so big, so so evidently doctrinal, also, meaning that, of course, they were part of broader political and social transformations, but they, they were also, um, uh, you know. You know, properly they decided sometimes from from a year to another to to fight with with a model that was more traditionally communal and another that was more you know more innovatively mercenary and seigneurial if you want that the the change was perceived right never think in the, never get tricked by the people say ah in history you know changes are are so gradual sometimes they they don't they didn't even understand uh, this is really not true. Right, people living in their own times tend to understand quite clearly what's going on. Um, it's just that it might have not been s maybe the single most important thing f to for them, right? And most historians that try to say it's a long process, it really means you know I don't know shit about <laughs> that for you to explain you about the cause. And I admit that even as an expert, I can tell you that it, it's not easy to read. You can't understand all the. They can't read the thing from different perspectives and are in agreeing that it was a complex of factors that surely has a face and has a logic, but um, it's um, not everything can be so readily uh, explained. I, but I will probably talk more about this uh, at some point. Um, the question, however, about mercenarism, because that's what today we're discussing, uh, mostly was, you know, how could be this companies, you know, so like so all these mercenaries at a certain point remained without employment and started looting around and even threatening single cities, whatever, could could last for so long. Right. This so long is like yeah, a good yeah, I mean a good half of a century, let's say. But the chronological cut should take into consideration also the the actual dimension of this threat. Right. So, in order to explain this, historiographically it's been said, you know, in the, Itali the let's say, central and northern Italian city-states, the ruling class that would have normally to provide the, the majority, uh, the greater part of the men-at-arms, would be uh, gradually absorbed by their professional activities and they preferred to recur to mercenaries requisite uh, both in, in other areas of Italy and abroad. Now this interpretation is uh, you know is a bit too teleological and frankly um, idealistic in, in, in nature. First of all um, it, while it is true we see because the, the main paradigm here has been Florence because Florence is the best documented city is the one that has indeed some impressive military capacities after Milan in terms of land power, there's no doubt. It was, even if they were two very different cities, right? One was conceived as a tyranny, the other as a republic. Um, they they actually made more or less the same things military-wise, even with, with important differences. Because Milan was actually one of the, not even the most, one of the earliest powers to make the, the largest scale uh, use of, of this foreign, uh, properly foreign knights, as mercenaries, but surely when it started, 
it, it wouldn't stop, right? It would, and it was uh, Milan was fundamentally an imperialistic uh, steamroller that was uh, almost capable of taking over all northern central Italy at some point by the mid-century. Florence was, yes, was the city of the oligarchs uh, of the let's say of the mercantile oligarchy that wouldn't like to spend too much, right? Apparently, right? Because Florence had some phases here, even some uh, rise of the the lower people that, yes, does document the, the strength of the, the popular element, but not quite in a military sense, as we think, mostly within the city, and partly because it had been oppressed at that point by a mercant oligarchy that had actually spent a lot uh, militarily wise so the the myth that we also recall from Machiavelli that you know these were just merchants that didn't want to spend too much for war by the early 14th century is not really true right um this is it, it the, it's really important to stress all the time how much m the world changed after the mid 14th century crisis like properly before the mid-14th century, there is a medieval civiliz civilization. After the mid-14th century, there is something else. It's already pre-modern. It, it, it's something else. There are different dynamics, so they're not really comparable. And in fact, one of the greatest historiographical mistakes in this regard has been to trace a parallelism along that pattern, along that line, right? Which um, has been, no, you, you can't compare the 14th century to the 15th century. This is a mistake done all the freaking time. Even in the rest of European history, they believe that infantry, for example, began to rise uninterruptedly in a kind of a progressive sense and from the 14th to the 15th century. Absolutely false. This is, first of all, not true uh, because there was a, a, an important process of refeudalization in between and probably of, you know, decline of infantry at some point. Exactly at this time. And secondly, the Infantries of the early 14th century, in, in political and social terms, and consequently military ones, had nothing to do, but minimally nothing to do with the ones of the late 15th century. They were a completely different thing. The ones of the early 14th century were peasants or, and or commoners. Uh, unprofessional troops that rebelled because they started being, you know, to emancipate themselves. The, the ones of the 15th century were proletarians framed under princely rule as professional armed troops. It's, a completely, it's, the, it's the same difference that exists, you know, naturally in a different way, but I don't know, between classical Hellenic warfare and Hellenistic warfare, so on the Macedonian model. They are two completely different societies that, in fact, are documented in different ways because we know paradoxically much more about this early warfare, in fact, also in the Middle Ages, than we know about the later one in a certain way because in this time, people participated to the army and wrote. Right after the crisis of mid 14th, mid 14th century, just mercenaries wouldn't write because they were the scum of society. They weren't absolutely they didn't participate places of power. They were not educated. They were not right. They were not that. Um, so and it is true, yes, that these, however, the the increase of professionalism did correspond to a gentrification of, uh, or better, of social certification. A hierarchization of the Italian uh, city states that was actually accompanied in a process, an important process of statalization. That this wasn't a bad thing. Um, the, 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 here I, we can't digress even about 13th century warfare, but to try to make you understand, even there, yes, the, 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 uh, I don't know, the, the battles of the Lombard League, uh, those were more like the classical Hellenic citizen that goes out there for civic spirit right you know by the late uh 13th century these guys are starting to be mostly peasants uh coerced and forced paid i mean their equipment is paid for by the state does it remember anything to you right yes because these things happen over and over this is like a bit like the marian reform at the same time and eventually there is a sort of late empire at this point when Infantry becomes weaker, and uh, and cavalry rises again in by the mid 14th century, and and it is a mistake to believe actually that the ruling classes weren't warlike. Uh, there is hardly any. I can't think of one of these Italian city states and say, you know, the ruling classes were just a, bu a bunch of fat merchants who wouldn't know how to use a weapon. This is basic, virtually like Florence may be the extreme of it, and it wasn't true even there. Um, these 
families, on the contrary, were, were very much military-minded in the sense that they uh, they tried to imitate as much as they could uh, the old uh, militia, or the old professional uh, ar military aristocracy. That in, in the case of Florence, yes, maybe they were properly becoming more, you know, as more elite as they were also dramatically wealthy. Properly, yes, they wouldn't want to risk, they wouldn't necessarily risk their own life in person, right? Uh, they would prefer to hire somebody else. But if you look at, you know, for example, northern Italy, that's, that's different. Also, other areas of central Italy, as we were saying before, there were, there were areas that provided some of the finest men-at-arms there, historically, such as the, the Romagnol area. Uh, the, all, all, all along the Apennine, that there was this warlike aristocracy that historically had, uh, you know, remained a bit that tough stock of uh, feudal um, elite kind of lifestyle, etc. And the, the local communities were more warlike because, as always, in the valleys, there is not much to live for. If you know there's a, a demographic surplus, people, young men, go out there for war, right? Not much different even from the Swiss or others um, in that regard. Um, what is rather more fascinating is, is how early 14th century Italian armies had developed dramatically and kind of crumpled in, in a relatively few decades that are exactly this ones, the ones from the, the, the 10th to the 30s of, of, of the 14th century, because of th that was possibly the single most intense uh, military activity in, in medieval Europe per 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 inhabitants, or at least for, yeah, I mean, for probably the, the sheer amount of resources consumed. This is mirrored also at sea, famously enough. There is nothing like in medieval history, like the amount of capital spent in the wars between Genoa and Venice at sea these years. That also detracted a lot of, a lot of, you know, of resources for the development of land armies, given that they were, you know, invested in, in naval warfare at the same time. And my my idea specifically is that Italy exhausted itself. Like in many areas of Europe where that surely were fighting also pretty hard. Literally, th this this is still a medieval pre industrial society. You cannot have twenty years of prolonged warfare when you employ on a regular basis um, tens of thousands of men uh, almost permanently uh, all over. the the peninsula in arms to, to, to fight against each other, not to have a, a radical impact from a structural point of view on the political and social structures, right? There is, in fact, after these years, um, the, um, there is literally a coldening of military activity. That brutal contraction in the mid-14th century properly is, is almost visualizable it, 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 in terms of, you know, the shrinking of, of military activity in Europe. Right, properly, you, you understand that the resources began to lack, armies began smaller, you, you, to be smaller. You see that individual, there was probably a, a, a different paradigm in, even in the uh, economical, like the most owners reverted to land, uh, co at least more compared to what they used to do before. The, the, the markets collapsed, the, the financial uh, sector suffered the most. So, and these were all the ones that had Overexhausted themselves in spending for these these mercenaries. You would wonder what all that money went normally in medieval Europe, in banking, financing, in war. What do you think they this this relatives did all the time? Like war wasn't like one thing among the others. It was basically the only thing this this politics did. Right? That's also why it's important to study military history at some level because you you can't distinguish that from any other uh, activity that these communities carried out. It was an insane, insane amount of sp expenditure. Uh, just, you know, uh, the, the Pope in, in the um, crusade against the Visconti in the first half of the 20s, of the, th of the 14th century, spent more, uh, something like um, 1,100,000 florins alone. Uh, and that's just a, a fraction of what the, the, the papacy has spent all over this time. Um, the same went with Venice for the siege of Zara. Similarly, Florence spent the same thing. The, the Milan did easily the same. I mean, we're talking about astronomic ciphers. It, it's something appalling. And you, you even wonder how... And, and this all passed through the construction of this bulky 
professional forces that fundamentally decided to abandon infantry and to rely just on cavalry. So the rise of infantry is my eyes, right? Uh, and, uh, and consider that these were exactly the lands where basically the most advanced infantry of Europe had been created. So uh, at that point, if they were the ones who were abandoning them, you have to be extremely careful about the reasons. So there is um, a quote here from um, from uh, Renoir, Les Hommes d'Affaires Italiens du Moyen Âge. Paris, if I say the, the year, there is surely a thunder roaring somewhere. It's 1968, so you can immediately understand what here that's the, the broader socio-economical bias in of of the you know uh, atmosphere of the time that insisted to much kind of material kind of structuralistic interpretation. But but let's say he says that the uh, here talking I think about. Uh, the Renaissance broadly meant so like 14th, 15th century altogether. It's a general idea. It says so the the businessman of the Renaissance, you're speaking mostly about Italy, I presume, says that in, in some moments war is indispensable to favor the development of affairs and prosperity of the city. True, because that is the reason why they did it, right? What what do you think people make war for? To to just be hopeless, you know, uh, to to ruin the world, war is wrong. It, it, war is just a poli one of political options. It's just not mm, better or worse than others, right? It, it depends on how you do it, and surely, you know, if you study how they, they did it at the time, that they did it pretty well. They, they wouldn't hesitate occasionally to declare war, but they don't do it in person anymore says the call to arms, uh, the too frequent call to arms, you know, create the problems in some way to, to those companies, um, uh, to those um, articulated societies that in, 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 in all of the world they demand the competence of everybody and not even what it's talking about exactly. It says the 14th century businessmen do not bear the sword. They don't march anymore under the banners of the city militias of such a glorious past. Right, this guy has literally no idea what he's talking about. Uh, just study early 14th century warfare, right, even the rest of 14th century warfare. They are the ones who declare war to finance it, they are not ones that, that fight it anymore. Ask the, the Lombard aristocracy whether this was even remotely close to the truth. Right, and see who were that ruled the cities at the time, what they did it like. They were always bearing arms. Yes, they were an elite, but it, that's exactly the point. The elite did participate to such things. And even among those who, you know, who, who boast noble origins, they have lost the taste of un unseating the sword, whatever. Uh, it's not any more reasonable and more economical without mobilizing the, the most important uh, citizens to pay... Uh, the mercenaries that make war while the merchants active in their own office will earn the the money to to pay them yes this is true the merchants were largely now they, they would say okay i don't want to go to war anymore there, there is a phenomenon of this 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 has to do with the, the citizenry altogether it's mostly the citizenry it says you know we have something to lose now we have you know why should we go to war when we can't pay somebody who does for us, right? This is hardly to do with the elites per se, though. It says, hence, the system of the condotta was born. So the system of the condotta actually was already born, because the, you know, these were normally hiring contracts that, you know, in, in any time in history when there is a mercenary, there is a hiring contract of some sort, right? And by the 13th century, there are what are called condotta, right, as, as such, but they were normal, you know, hiring contracts, right? So eventually, the term refers more stereotypically to what we see in the 15th century. This highly articulated, you know, hiring uh, hiring of an entire army that already knew what to do, etc. That here there is not anything yet. So for the time of the development of its own professional activity, of its love for the, the from for earning, in the sense that he has of his intellectual superiority, his contempt towards brute force. 
of the achieved awareness of the power of gold uh, of, of, of money, the merchant has created the, the, the condottier. In these two types of men, counterpose and complementary, characterize the Italian society of the 14th century, the men of business, especially in the continental cities, has become a bourgeois uh, fully man. So the, the knightly spores uh, uh, that, uh, that he uh, you know, aims at or that he bears have only an ornamental society, uh, function. Excuse me. So th this is, okay, as always in historiography, it, it's not that this person says something that is diametrically opposed to what we, we know, like it's just 50 years past from now, but today we know that it's factually not true. And we know that not only the Italian elite kept actually being invested in warfare, but that they were factually the ones that were increasingly more in control of the same. Right? This, this analysis wouldn't explain how could these powers have an army on their own. Uh, and uh, let's say, you know, and, and, and deciding how to use it, right? Because at this point, there is still not fundamentally one single guy that goes out there on its own and decides what to do. In, in the, in the 14th, during the 14th century, the free companies are employed like that in, in the sense that they, they, they existed and the various Italian city states said, okay, you know, you all have the power here. The, if you, you know, Instead of attacking us, we'll pay you for going against uh, against that other city, right? And we have a deal, right? This doesn't mean that those Italian city states wouldn't have an army. Um, as we were saying before, uh, and we will see it now, the um, the consistency of these free companies wasn't actually such to to threaten the the establishment in the peninsula, and and this is often overlooked, right? The the country wasn't ravaged by these armies more than it had been ravaged by the same Italian armies in, in the generations before. Um, they were simply another way of making war, right? And in part, there is surely an increased distance from the exercise of arms of the bourgeois. But speaking of the elites, these were kind of aristocratically militarized in nature. And they, there is actually an increase properly in this sense of properly chivalric knightly character of the same, even uh, often in a feudal sense, because in all this, um, not only the Italic Kingdom was part of the Holy Roman Empire, but there was an, a very important coordination and connection with with um, with foreign sovereigns in, for the balance in the peninsula. It was becoming ever more intertwined with the rest of the world of Europe, as it had already been. In fact, I made a video last winter that is, uh, I think, foreign intervention in Italy in the 14th century. It makes you understand a lot about that, too. That is to say, who did come to Italy and why and how, and especially what was it rely, uh, relying, militarily speaking. And you understand that most of the times, actually, foreign rulers coming there were relying on Italian armies to do what they wanted to do, because they didn't have one, simply one on their own. And in the case, especially at this, I think the one of John of Bohemia is the most eloquent, right? It, that He had no army. He just used the ones that he was provided with because there, there were always some cities who wanted to fight against one another and these rulers had some kind of international status, recognition, etc. And so they, they, they acted as such, with sometimes with reenacting this farce of the empire, that point that was ridiculously uh, way, uh, ridden also by this local powers to say, we are the, the Ghibelline bikers because that guy gave us the title. Yes, John of Bohemia, that <laughs> never accomplished a great deal in terms of, uh, aside from roaming around in Europe, fighting here and there, and eventually being killed at Crecy. Great knight, great uh, figure, a romantic one, almost a fairy tale one. But in fact, that was a fairy tale, right? What really made war at that point were the troops that were controlled by the, the, the various lords in the peninsula. And these were never short of them, even in the times of the, the free companies, that surely did impact the local politics and surely ravaged around and surely made a mess, as, as you can imagine, but because they were pushed by these various powers, they were supported, they were financed, right? If they, they hadn't been financed, it would have come there. This was not really an area that where you could arrive and there was nobody, you see, like France, where it was crippled by by the the, the English invasion, so 
I don't know, from Paris, the king said, you know, I'm sorry, Southern France, we can't mobilize. And, you know, the English would go lay waste everything they found unopposed, virtually. Um, the, the, the Italian peninsula was a, a thorny uh, area. It was a, a, military, a, a deeply militarized and dangerous, fundamentally, and, you know, uh, but in this sense also rich and exploitable place, uh, where most of these companies rose because they had been hired by the same Italians. And this is the point that that has been, in a sense, misunderstood. And so even when they g went lost, they, they, they properly they lost touch on it and lost control on them, they, they wouldn't be able to, I don't know, create a power there. At the end of the day, all these mercenaries came back where they, they, they had come from, right? There was no possibility. It was also an alienation. I mean, part of the reason why these free companies existed in the first place is that w once they were paid for for their service if they were paid but that's another reason for which they rebel often they they were out of there on their own what they would would they, would they do were local communities going to integrate them no uh, could they cor carve themselves a, a, a private principal no right they could enter a bit this broader political game but there was no it, it was within that game not outside of it as a competitor as such this has been a properly over overlooked as an interpretation. Uh, in 1325, um, Florence uh, deployed at the campaign and battle of Alto Pascio that we'll see at some point next to uh, 1500 mercenary cavalry, 500 Florentine cavalry, 400 of which provided by the Cavallata system of the citizenry that that was fundamentally as w sort of of an elite of the uh, you see the, the the world citizenry wouldn't participate to military expenses because war was becoming really too costly uh, properly the panoply was increasing as you know in weight and you know in, in the development etc so they would say okay we pay for it but somebody else goes fight for us so that counts for mercenaries but then there were some cavalata citizen that were maybe even being paid by other citizens to go there, but they would go in person, right? And they were kind of good. Cavalry, not, not excessively, you know, much, but not as as strong or even as numerous, as you understand here, as the foreign mercenaries. In any case, Florence get defeated at the Battle of Alto Pascio, but by uh, essentially a Lucchese and Milanese coalition where the, um, the Germans of... Uh, of the Visconti that had arrived in the help of Castruccio, Castracani, ha uh, Lord of, of Lucca, uh, essentially crashed. Or, uh, but it's not even to be given for granted at that point because at least Florentine sources says during the dur say during the battle they had managed to break through them, whatever. So because we don't know what concretely what happened in these f changing of you know of the very battle lines we don't even know clearly who, who was deployed where so we can't for that battle specifically we can't say it's the germans right in the same year however the same uh um Atzo Visconti who was coming back f to lombardy from tuscany after the victory was hired in the same way by the uh the bonacolsi of mantua and the Este and the La Scala to fight against Bologna. It was probably the, the most conservative um, uh, army in Italy at that point. It were very robust infantry, or at least very quantity, uh, very numerous uh, infantry component was crushed at Zappolino in, in the same way. And even in there, uh, yes, the Germans do figure, but we don't know exactly whether it was them who carried out. Probably yes, probably these can be considered German successes. Um, it's just that um, in the same way as we've seen Florence had had them. For Bologna not so much, but at that point the, the defeat of Zappolino wasn't much due to that, but rather to the, to the military expertise of the, of the commanders of the, the Ghibelline army that were, you know, lords properly meant, and the Po Valley lords were at that point developing some very effective coalition armies such as th that example, and surely the Germans helped in that sense, is a shock troop. Um, in any case, you see how this mix is going on, and you and you can't say at this point, ah, 
you know, because that that's the, the prevalent uh, historiographic interpretation. See, now there, there is this deep crisis of, you know, uh, of of the quality of this army. Not really. Actually, the quality of this army is increasing. Right. This is not a moment in which these Italian powers were saying, "Oh my God, now we're growing hostages of these foreign mercenaries." They were hiring them themselves. <laughs> like they called them from north of the Alps expressly, and they were building actually way more effective armies. As Florence, exactly after the defeats of Montecatino and Alto Pasha, began to to say, "Okay, look, we have to, to transition. We have to make armies that look more similarly to the ones of the." great uh, Ghibelline seigneuries of the north that were, you know, the ones generally more provided with mer foreign mercenaries, uh, with, with the German ones especially because of their special connection with, uh, with the Germ, you know, with, with the imperial, say, power, so they, they, they probably were closer also to probably to the, count, to the ways of access to German mercenaries, etc. But gradually, by the 20s, the 30s, also Guelph powers basically begin to hire this, this troops as well. And mercenaries existed also in Italy, meaning that, for example, the Guelphs had uh, recruited a so-called Talia, that was a contributive uh, army. Uh, it, it was a way to, uh, it was essentially putting money in common to hire mercenaries that were largely, we don't know, some say they were also foreigners. Uh, among the Guelphs, the French mostly prevailed, at, at least initially, as they were instead the 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 the, the Angevin French axis that you know was backing the Guelph powers, but ultimately, uh, and you understand that properly the preference from independent Transalpine companies was in, in still in in small numbers, right? In, or, or better, in in large numbers altogether, but still th these companies were still small. They were still not armies capable of going around there and taking uh, cities hostage. Un unless there was some very specific situation, meaning that you know a few hundred cavalrymen that can do that, surely do not speak much for their effectiveness, or rather, but for the weakness of the crisis of, of that city in a specific moment. In fact, most of the cities that that suffered from these turnovers, like look, it's because they were exhausted at that point, for exactly from a military point of view. We know that their their manpower, their their economical resources were sh shrinking dramatically because of all the sheer military expanse. Um, so, mm, even this idea, in fact, that the Cavallata was this one song of, you know, the old institution of, you know, the, the war horses up kept by the fat people and the rich, etc., is, yeah, I mean, the tendency was to that shrinking, but at the same time, they were the same people who were okay with hiring other mercenaries, and they weren't doing it at the expense of their own freedom in the city or anything. So the military instrument was in control, actually, of politics. Also, and this is yet another interesting take, is that the, the rise of the condotta is being explained with the rise of seigneuries, right? Because the idea is that the lords feared the people, so they didn't want to arm them, and they preferred thus mercenary troops. Uh, this is also not truly really a convincing dichotomy. Um, if you look at the battles uh, between uh, at the wars between Padua and Verona, for example, at the same time, you see that the popular city was much more uh, cavalry based than than the than the seigneurial one initially. Right later on, yes, it is true, but the, the, there is a, an important reliance on mounted armies, properly by the, the seigneuries, the lords. And again, mounted army means at this point that cavalry is becoming so uh, properly the, the gear is becoming so expensive, the training so specialized that you know, yeah, average average people wouldn't like to to spend that. It costs you too much, right? So it was now all you know in the hands of some lords that said, okay, we take. The of, the of the lord of the city that said, okay, we, we managed to, to, to hire some mercenaries to which we can crush other cities and cashing their wealth. And all this was backed by the merchants. So it is true that because they, they, they would take over the, the neighboring cities' uh, banks and assets, the, the Milanese did that. And that's why also they were the most successful in this broader military development. Um, 
but uh, there were still lots of you know oligarchs or aristocrats who would actually go at war right and there wasn't the substitution for which nobody in the city you know went to fight right it's especially in the north of this but even in the center the, this is really not the case it's not shown right and actually the rise of the seniory was the rise of this oligarchs of this aristocrats who were great military men generally speaking so no really this substitutive uh, idea is mostly designed around the stereotype of 15th at uh, the 15th century mostly around florence because that was the most mercantile of all uh, continental cities in a sense excuse me i drink a little so <clears throat> um the uh, the idea is also that the lords couldn't rule over cities that didn't like them, right? Some faction had to have supported them. And this faction always wanted to properly participate to military matters in person because it was a way to organize uh, the army, to, to have this political influence on it, to, to manage strategy that could make them rich more or less, think about the loot, think about the ransoming. So it was a lucrative business of which the mercenaries were just the final rank soldiers in a way. That's what soldiers do, right? They're paid professionals, that's it, right? As long as they get paid, everything is okay. Sometimes they wouldn't get paid. And so <laughs> that, that's what part of the reason why they, they, they rebelled, but there are hardly true mutinies in the sense of, um, you know, an army that was regularly in service of somebody at some point decides not to be there anymore um, from a day to another. There were some moments in which the political crisis of a city could say, okay, the armed element would take over. But very often the people could kick out the, these mercenaries from the same city uh, if they didn't like them. There are great examples of this in places like uh, like Pisa, in, like in Padua, right? Even very, you know, squeezed and impoverished people um, after years of war could actually be uncontrollable within the city gates. The, 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 the mercenaries feared them because they were consistently the only one, the, the only situation which they had, because normally the, their deal was as cavalrymen, a they're might in pitch battles in this massive uh, shock charges that kind of de uh, refine even the, the, the general tactics of combined arms that we're describing at the beginning. But in the city streets, hell, in the city streets, the people was was like nuts, right? And it, it, it and, they, and together with that were always some noblemen, right? So it's never there's never like just it's the the disarmed people and terrible mercenaries that just. Uh, can do whatever they want, right? This is the the extremization of stereotype never quite occurred um, as such. Uh, and uh, still, of course, the military participation was there. Like um, the uh, if you look at the army compositions, they they were hardly any old mercenaries. Like infantry, for example, was still there. And uh, even if it, it lost in importance, still we know that, you know, the the statutes said, you know, they had to be kept efficient. In fact, there is an increase of specialized personnel, mostly crossbowmen, etc. These were not mercenaries. I mean, they were soldiers in the same way, if you want, but they were locals, right? They they have with this presence is maintained, right? And surely during the 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 forties and the eighties of the fourteenth century, there were there was an increase also properly of the together with the free companies as, as large armies on their own, um, some introduction of other, like, more like infantry, etc. There is no doubt of this. But there is also a contingental nature of these armies as well, that is not like having, like, literally an army on, on, you know, belonging to a local community that has all the resources and is, you know, entrenched in, you know, well-defended city gates, has the, the stocks and all, um, in a uh, military administration it, it's something more more daring in, in nature if you want and uh, the point is really that cities didn't have difficulties to find the money necessary to hire these mercenaries 
and they would be very careful about that, right? As we were saying before, when they when the war was over, they wouldn't even bother themselves paying them anymore. They would just let them out there to go to do whatever they wanted. And normally, these mercenaries didn't have the capacity to take cities over, right? They the said the same cities feared them legitimately because they wouldn't want to risk to to fight against them in a bloody battle in you know in, in open field for what. Right, it would ravage the countryside, but it would they would go away, and that's what they normally did. Most of them melted away, came back the the way they came, like the the, the countries of origin. Again, without really taking root, this is yet another important aspect of this phenomenon. Because normally in history, you know, you eventually that this if these mm, people are victorious, they want to settle, they want to you know, create power on their own, they would. Look at what had happened, I don't know, after the collapse of Constant the Byzantine Empire, right? Westerners settling as private lords here and there. Um, in Italy, literally, th this wouldn't happen. There was no space. The, the local polities had no... There was no way. There was no factually, no... Because the city was the center of everything, and the city would simply shut its gates, and there was no way to integrate this, these people. They didn't speak their language. They, they were just about war, and they wouldn't distinguish even from the civilian life. They they were just there to loot and to receive money, and they wouldn't even care about anything else, right? So there was no other really pos possibility of integration. True is that these guys were very good soldiers, as we were saying before. I mean, they surely were capable. They they knew their own stuff. But even about this, um, as we will see, they weren't really always victorious they were often defeated as well and again if you if, if aside from single battles you actually study the strategic context you realize that most of the time they had they stood no chance they, they wouldn't even come to to grips with with, with Italians because simply they, it was inconvenient they didn't want to die either right and there were some battles where they were consistently defeated and so that you know that shows that Really, the system wasn't cracking, wasn't a moment of anarchy where everybody could do whatever they wanted there. There were, on the contrary, enormous political interests to back these armies uh, against the rival city-state to, to, you know, to pay them, to properly fuel them, to make them happening in the first place. So, as we are seeing before, between the 40s and the 80s of the 14th century, it's, let's say, the moment of greatest activity of the uh, free mercenary companies. And they were dominated by foreigners, right? This is really important. Um, in uh, the... Um, there, there would be some interesting consideration to make about why, for example, the Italians didn't join this more the years. Sometimes they did, actually. Right, so we should always understand who were these guys and what did they do. Because also, um, not th yeah, there were some political and social instances in this as well. Because armies were always followed by um, non -com -com non combatant element of looters, beggars, uh, soldier trained, you know, the merchants of you know. This was kind of normal because these armies looted on a regular basis, so th there was something to leave off of. So in, in 1334, in, yeah, the, the so-called Knights of the Dove, of the Dove, the, the Cavalieri della Colomba, they were Germans, they, uh, they imperversed in central Italy. But even here, yes, they were just a company that roamed around a little bit, but there weren't many. And they dissolved, and they wouldn't. If you look at the broader political spectrum of things that were happening at the time, it's not that people cared. Like this wasn't a major event compared to the at this in these years there were dramatic military activities in the north, in the center. It, uh, like if you have 400, 500 knights doing such certain things, yes, they can't be a problem because they they don't have somebody controlling them at least apparently because there's always somebody controlling the paying them or uh, negotiating with them telling them where to go etc but again it's not that this radically impacted the local events at the time what was actually more important was in 1339 when other germans reunited in a first company of saint george there is a uh, 
an important uh, chivalric bias, you know, St. George, protector of knights, etc. Uh, the Germans brought a lot of this kind of um, properly chivalric element. This is the maybe an uh, important divide. The Germans here are, uh, especially in the first in the early 14th century, they're able to score dramatic victories in regular, basically, condition of, of, of numerical inferiority that are utterly disconcerting. That is, the Germans, you know, that historically had, you know, Germany developed cavalry later than a country like France, born, you know. Um, but at, in this point in history, by the 14th century, actually, they, ca they came to parallel French cavalry by, by might, by power. And, but they maintained a bias that was essentially an, in, an individualistic one. The French were mostly about, at this point, stereotyp stereotypically, you know, the, no, the haughty no, and arrogant nobility that arrive and think they are so much. And they are, I mean, they are good in this scenario if you look, uh, analyze their military quality, but they're not, like, top, right? What really breaks, like, air, like are the Germans, like few times they get defeated, but always in some kind of desperate situation which they, they fight to the life. But these people are capable of carrying out charges of literally something like 1 to 20, 1 to 30, and winning, right? Often against Italians, often uh, also against uh, other, you know, Provencal, French, whatever. And they are objectively, in terms of military quality, literally something else. Why this is the case would be really interesting to study. Um, I personally have a, you know, as we were saying before, I analyzed a bit what, what, what German and Italian history in, 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 those, in those times, and my impression is that Germany was, uh, I think in Italy war was actually m more intense, but the, the Germans were m more, still more primitively realizing on a feudal society. I mean, Italians had states, had widespread literacy, had ad, in massive administrative systems, military struck, you know, they, they really, they were full of money, they were the richest people on earth. The Germans were mostly like knights, were still like, you know, this rural, feudal, um, individualistic element in, imbued with chivalric you know, obsession, to say the least. Germany never was uh, never had a, an eastern frontier. It was like always kind of a fluid system. So this favored from from the bottom also in this idea of, you know, responding to a call of one king or the other in the, 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 all the problems of the, you know, at this point, the fragmented, um, uh, well, the failed German monarchy, let's say, that were, you know, it was against, you know, there was always somebody against another containing the crown. Um, and so... Compared, yes, maybe to an Italian uh, knight uh, living in the city with, with some specific interest, a, a resident, you know, a firm residence, some assets, it just has something to lose. The Germans, coming from that wilder world with this, this kind of more specifically chivalric, or mind, in the sense of warlike minded, individualistic exaltation, were capable of carrying out mostly, well, yes, these were just shock charges very often against even sensible advice, tactically speaking, but because of that kind of comp complete lack of, of self, you know, <laughs> you know uh, care, they, they would be able to launch literally themselves into the fray and either break in or die. And there are certain episodes, at some point I can't list you, that are utterly, like, you remain there to say, how is it possible that certain people could do something? They, well, the Germans did. So it's not a stereotype. These were really good, very hell of good troops, right? It's just that they were unruly, right? They're undisciplined, um, violent in the sense they, they wouldn't they wouldn't have a, a concrete distinction between military or civilian life, so... They were in a way incompatible. There is a lot of stereotypes, very harsh stereotypes of these bloodthirsty barbarians that, you know, were just violent and, you know, they, they would take any opportunity to take uh, the, a city in hostage if they could. Um, there are episodes like this, but most of the times they, they were, again, they were paid by somebody and they were doing this still, you know, searching for a next master to be employed by. Not, not to carve an autonomous part because it f was factually impossible. The, there is uh, in, in northeastern Italy a great deal of um, 
German influence properly meant, meaning that at some point, especially when Padua surrendered to the, the La Scala Signory, they, the, the German bikeries from southeastern Germany came to, you know, uh, on behalf mostly of the Habsburgs to, to put order. So there was a firm German presence that came al almost to a military occupation. But that's as if, you know, what was happening in other cities when an Italian lord took over. Right, had its own mercenaries and would use them like that. Um, so again, it's not really a matter of loss of control overall on the system from from local powers. Uh, it's rather a you know an, a massive injection of these foreign element that comes to dominate mostly the, the military picture. And it's not always I say even dominating is properly not correct. There is always a native. Italian element that counters that. There are some, for example, the Rossi of Parma were very good commanders fighting against the, the La Scala and later on in the Venetian Florentine alliance against the same. Um, this had lots of German mercenaries, but were able to, to inflict them some of the most, some of the harshest punishments, disciplinarily speaking, uh, and because of the violence they would carry out, etc. As other soldiers that are documented, even in, you know, Italians in the Condotto made the same thing. It's just that now these were very good soldiers. They were handsomely paid. They were important. So in a way, they, they also let them do a bit what, what they wanted sometimes for for reason of, of control on the same. The same Rossi in Parma did something similar, right? And consider altogether that war was all over. Right, it wasn't triggered by these guys, for example. It, it was always, it, you know, th those guys were there because Italians made war against each other continuously, continuously. It was something unbelievable. Until you don't read that, you you have no idea of the scale of this. You you wonder how much has been properly consumed in in a, in a street. Um, a, a huge chunk of European resource was completely burned in the, this stuff. I mean, that helped to form, I mean, these are the same years in which humanism was born, in which seigneuries were born, in which the original states were born. So war here was a mean to an end. But it was an enormous, enormous amount of money. It, it's incredible. It's utterly incredible. And naturally, this was paid by the local communities, you know, whether or another. Right. And that's why also infantry declined, because the classes that had traditionally provided at this point were literally exhausted, starting from the peasantry. Because the first victim of these wars was naturally the countryside, right? And the cities dependent on the countryside as well. So that's a bit self explanatory. Um, in um, the Company of St. George, 1339, those were. Uh, actually a threat to the city of Milan itself. That's the first serious threat that came, came from free companies. Um, in the, these were veterans of the Venetian uh, Florentine War that the De La Scala had fought. Uh, and um, basically the, the, the Visconti in Milan had kind of quarreled with each other, you know, when one had expelled his uncle etc and they and this guy that was Lodrizio Visconti basically hired the veterans um, of the, the La Scala who didn't have money to pay them but so they were promised to loot Milan in, in exchange they, they marched on Milan naturally the thing was mediated so but it brought to the battle of Parabiago that it w was fought outside you know Milan where you had there for the first time actually a, a purely mercenary army albeit still commanded by a Visconti in that sense, and the Milanese army, actually full of also mm, allies from the rest of Italy, in a sense, um, with mercenaries on their own, but permanently it was still the city forces, right? And so this was a major battle. It was one of the, the most cruel battles at the time fought in the snow. It was, you know, something appallingly violent, um, fought in, like, in three days, apparently, in a row. And... Um, the, the Milanese forces were about to be annihilated, but for the, the, the usual flank attack, rare attack, you know, by surprise, they managed to win. It was a, an utter bath of blood. Uh, lots of people died from both sides. Uh, Milan was safe, so the, the, the city system actually proved stronger than the mercenary system. 
but the Milanese hired part of the German survivors. And, uh, and they went on with that, right? So think about it. Um, eventually, in 1342, there is the great company of another German, Werner von Urslingen, famous comfort. There were quite a lot of anecdotes about these figures because allegedly on his cuirass you could read Enemy of, of the Faith. Uh, actually, Enemy of God and uh, Enemy of Piety, right? So this tells you a bit what was the, <laughs> the average mindset. Um, besides, you know, these are considered... Uh, less than two centuries afterwards, the Landsknecht and as Lutherans would come to, they wanted to hang the, the Pope and sack Rome, right? You know, it's it, a bit, there are some kind of ideas that this uh, 14th century guy in the, in, in the fir mercenary in German, exactly in the moment of the controversies between the papacy and the empire that was getting radicalized, even these powers were becoming eventually weaker on their own, uh, took this properly anti anti Christian character, right? And uh, for a person that lived within a military reality in the fourteenth century, to be a completely and radically alienated individual was was perfectly coherent from all the psychological data that we can require about this. Uh you know, John Oakwood is said to have cut uh, a nun in half because two of his men wanted to, to rape her both and wanted to contend her, so he sold solomonically the thing. I mean, these, these are the kind of people that we're talking about. And so, as I often say, uh, it's practically impossible for us, even in the most atrocious violences that we see every day, to properly understand what, what it meant to, to leave something like that and properly in a 14th century reality. There are s simply certain places with your mind where you don't want to go. Well, these are surely in the mindset of a free company commander during the 14th century. Uh, but even uh, the company of Werner von Urslingen did, wouldn't mm, alter significantly like the local. They, they raided around, they went fighting a bit for some power, but for another. But they were among the many armies that existed around. Again, so it's not a huge deal. Then eventually it was the great company. Right? Uh, I don't remember actually here whether the one of Urslingen was. There was one that basically raided um, from the start from from central Italy, arrived in the Po Valley, and then was escorted out. And you 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 understand there that this was a problem because it was dangerous, right? It, it looted some areas, etc. But the city, it basically was na never able to take any city. That is the only factual center of power existing in Italy. There's no broader rural scenery or whatever. No, it's the city and always a city. And you realize there are, there are two factions, two alliances within Italy. One wants to send the company against, <laughs> in a, one against the other, and eventually they manage to expel it. They come back north of the Alps. I mean, this speaks for even a diplomatic coordination and arrangement that, that was able to make things work to dilute this problem, this anomaly, if you want. So again, even in the 40s, there is not much of what you would see as, uh, you know, the, 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 the area was ravaged without control. They didn't know what to do with this. Actually, they, they, they expelled it. It lasted a, f a few months, right, in, in, in inside. So then the, um, this I haven't studied in detail as the others, but I have the suspicion that, you know, things got in wars, of course, but even in there, there wasn't, nothing so radically dramatic as it's been historiographically believed at some point, there is the Great Company, constituted by uh, an ex-hospitalier, the Provencal uh, Montréal um, d'Albarna, as it was called, or from Montréal, according to the, the Italians, would always vernacularize foreign names too. So this was a, you know, a, a group of, you know, so soldiery from French origin, right, mostly can, but there were also uh, Hungarians, but also Germans, especially, you know, that, that after that the leader was decapitated in Rome by Cola di Renzo, um, passed the command of the German Count Conrad uh, von Landau, 
the Conte Lando, according to the town. And um, to which, however, the Tuscans inflicted a harsh defeat at Biforco in 1358. Right. Uh, you understand that there is, a, there is actually a bit turning, but here we see fundamentally one of the leaders is beheaded by the Lord of Rome. Another, uh, the, the rest of the army is, is crushed by in Tuscany later on. So even here you see this is not soft place to go around, right? You risk to be taken out consistently as such. Um, even uh, at, at this point about the military organization of these groups, you would start even wondering because, by the way, this is happening, as you know, even with the White Company after the, the, the during the truces of the uh, of the Hundred Years War. So sometimes these are not really. Uh, yes, they enter Italy as mercenaries because somebody hires them normally, but some mar maybe are, they just come, they think they can do maybe whatever they want, but they really can't. Like, the, in this aspect, it's very, it's very even, because you have to evaluate the properly the level of, of coordination and organization, um, uh, properly in military quality. Right, you have to have a cohesion in here, and it's difficult to maintain one. What what what, what you realize, especially before the four, you know, before the fifties, is that uh, these companies do not really have a fixed um, organic. Like they they're just a group group of desperate people uh, that have a short term objective of looting and then going away. So this doesn't speak even for a big deal of military solidity cohesion after all yes they, they're most of their members are soldiers but again who is that controls them what's the discipline within it we are, we are also not really documented about it more than much right and um so what happens later on which is exemplified instead by the properly by the white company is is something different is properly the formation of something more cohesive that could exist within the system so that's where it gets in my opinion most interesting and this is not a coincidence that the english carried this out because the english had as you know during the hundred years war basically the most successful military system possibly in in history tactically wise meaning that if you really look at the numbers and how you know the outcome of battles repeatedly that there is hardly any army in history that scored the same success as the english one during the hundred years war this is no joke this is no personal opinion this is pure mathematics um so it's not debatable this doesn't mean that it was the greatest army in history it doesn't mean anything right because we know close of it simply speaking it changes but it's still meaningful because of of all these various french germans etc at the end of the day the Actually, the guys that are not very present in great numbers, hadn't been present in great numbers in Italy, but that turned out to be the most successful under John Opo, in fact, are, are the English. And this is no coincidence. In fact, these would be the guys that maintained a permanent military organization, compact one, that they, that, that they would tr tried and they, properly they acted intelligently to themselves systematically at the service um, of some Italian state. So John Oakwood, as you know, the Italians call him Giovanni Acuto, just by consonant. This was, you know, there are the result, but we'll talk about John Oakwood in some other video, possibly dedicated to the White Company itself, etc. And he was apparently the son of a tanner of the region of Colchester, who after having fought in France, found himself in 1360 at the head of an heterogeneous troop, uh, in which, however, the English element prevailed. You know how the system of the indenture is a bit the same of the condotta, all right? Uh, the, uh, the English armies were raised like that. They, they were mostly men at arms then with, with, um, with, with a leader, with a contractor, who, uh, and lots of a long bowmen um, who eventually remained at control of their own companies after the war and a bit like uh, as we've seen before uh, in Italy in France was a bit the same end of the war what did they do mm -hmm. so uh, for f some time Oakwood had been part of the great company of the Marquis of Montferrat 
right? Uh, so here you see properly an Italian actually that had been at the service of the Count of Savoy against the Visconti of Milan. Perhaps he fought in the Battle of Brigny on April the 6th, 1362. In the following year, it was at the service of Pisa in a war against Florence. So you see here even the typical eater of a, of a mercenary who came to Italy. This, this was a, a person with a consistent military experience who sold his service essentially to these various... He joined other companies, he, he was at the service of, of cities, right? So again, this was like a career, a profession, a business. It wasn't like, you know, they, he, and he learned naturally what the situation was like politically, militarily, in the peninsula and so on. Eventually, he is to be found in, in, at the service of the Visconti, too. Mobility was really a lot here, right? Um, it was normal to have folk for someone and against some. The same Florentines, right, that made his beautiful portrait in, in the cathedral had actually been defeated by him. So that tells you also what, how complex relations really were and alternating. And you understand that this depended on the same Italian powers. So for nine years, Oakwood was at the head of the White Company, and he was the most feared condottiero in Italy. He fought against Florence, as we were saying before, against the Pope, against the Emperor Charles IV. But in 1372, he passed to the side of the Pope against Galeazzo Visconti, that he defeated in the Battle of the River Chiesa in Lombardy, on May the 7th, 1373. Eventually he reconciled with Milan and the papacy uh, and he um, turned to Florence um, of, the, uh, of, of which he actually threatened and uh, scourged the, the territories. So in vain Caterina from Siena invited Oakwood to leave Italy and to go to a crusade against the Turk. Uh, this is an, yet another in very interesting thing. I mean, the, the knighted chivalry character. For example, Malerba, that was the German commander of the Company of St. George defeated in Parabiago, he actually, you know, redeemed, he, he kind of repented himself, and he um, joined the crusade in Smyrna uh, in, uh, I think, it was 1342, 1343, something like that, where he died against the Turks. Um, so the, the, this was, as you know, the 14th century, a moment of important moral tension of, you know, of this crisis, the, the plague, and of, I mean, it's, it's impossible for us to understand how, what, what could be the motivations of people to, to live in this such violent reality and to, to how to cope with that. In 1376, John Oakwood is, uh, again on papal service. Uh, uh, during which he invaded Tuscany and Florence managed, however, to, to buy him by offering him 130,000 florins. It's, a, it's really a lot for the time. It's a sum to which... Uh, so this, this properly tells you how important this commander was compared to what the, the previous ones, the previous companies had been. Right. In fact, to this sum were added the contributions of Pisa, of Lucca, of Arezzo, and Siena, so all the major Tuscan cities. Thus, in a few months, the English captain uh, received something like 225,000 florins. Furthermore, Florence committed itself to pay him uh, an annual and eventually like life grant of 1,200 florins. And even in here, as we were saying before, in spite of this huge amount of money, Oakwood, uh, first of all, remained at the service of the Pope against Florence and his allies still for two years during this, the War of the so-called uh, Eight Saints. And he, uh, he, is directly he was directly responsible for the massacre of Cesena in, in, in Romagna, where he, uh, perhaps 5,000 people lost their lives. In a few weeks later, he entered openly at the service of Florence and of the League um, uh, that, that was constituted, as we were saying before, and that insured 250,000 Florence a year. It's an enormous sum, right? But this was naturally also to maintain his troops. Uh, 
Also, in this period, he married Donina, who was the natural daughter of Bernabal Visconti, who was another actual you know, commander in, in inside as an Italian lord. He became thus owner of a castle and of lands, and up to his death, that took him in 1394, he remained loyal to Florence. So much that you, again, it was same before you can see the beautiful fresco still in, in the Florence Cathedral. And so here you understand there is a really a qualitative step f further. That is to say, properly Oakwood showed the, um, you know, the capacity, not just of understanding Italian politics, but to, to dwell within it and to maintain an, an army as such, right? Um, he was, in fact, an effective and cautious strategist, where right? he was always on the move, right, exploiting these various uh, opportunities that arose. And he was also uh, seemingly very appreciated by his men, that whom he paid regularly and that would never mutinate, which was a big deal at the time, right, meaning that desertions, uh, you know, divisions within the same companies as we're saying before, there was no real cohesion yeah, unless they were properly paid and maintained there. So, Surely Oakwood was defeated, um, but at all times he managed to reconstitute his own army, right? Especially um, uh, making, you know, relying especially on on, he, on Englishmen, right? There was this national connection. Uh, this, this would be the, the second company of St. George, right? So the 16th century Italian humanist Paulus Jovius um, appreciated him, right, in memory, right, Th these were figures that were estimated, right, it was normal for in, in, in the Italian political and military culture to say, yes, they hated each other's gods, but they recognized valor when they, they, they saw it among the enemies, wherever they were. And, um, in fact, uh, the humanist calls him acerrimus bellator et contactor, uh, contactor egregious, literally. And, However, as we were saying before, Oakwood never uh, actually managed to constitute a true and proper fortune. He had received an enormous amount of money, and yet he had basically spent them all in the maintenance of his army. Right? And shortly, after, uh, shortly before his death, right, he had decided, in order to get rid of his debts, to sell his goods, um, that were basically a villa close to Florence and a castle close to Arezzo in order to come back to England. And so even for the most successful adventurer, uh, arguably in Italian history, this, this phase and this free companies of foreigners, uh, he had not managed to integrate himself in the Italian community. And Again, this is incredibly important because uh, this is almost basically the end of... Uh, it, it is already the end. Like when he died, um, the, the Italians had already, as we were saying before, basically taken uh, over the, the, the mercenary uh, system, right? As properly, as, as in terms of national participation. And so he was a bit the last. There was the, the last great foreign company of, of course that arrived um, uh, had arrived before in fact in the 80s um, in uh, that um, was the, the Breton one um, of uh, Sylvestre uh, Bude that um, actually terminated with in 1380 specifically actually with the Battle of Marino that was won by Alberigo from Barbiano uh, at the head of a third company of St. George. And so what does this mean concretely? Well, it, it means objectively that these armies, right, we have seen this terrible you know, moment of the free companies, but was it so terrible, like compared to the previous generations or the ones who would come, like was like Italy particularly affected by by the phenomenon in terms of what was the regular violence that existed 
in the peninsula. This is, in my opinion, yet to be demonstrated. Like, um, in that, especially the um, presence of these companies, it seems to me, unequivocally, the product of an Italian politics. Not of Italian politics, of, of an Italian policy, let's say better, meaning properly of using these armies, paying them to simply throw them against one another. And developing the system, and in fact, in the 15th century, would be, as we've seen with John Alcott, set in it a little bit, right? And also the, the Italian condottieri word this, right? An army that is maintained as a nucleus, as such. Not many companies, like at the beginning of the century, the smaller companies. And then the condottieri could, could have a career, could, could marry into the local seigneuries, they could have some land. Right. Before Oakwood, financially, none of this had happened. And this is mostly typical of the 15th century. So, what happened later, as we've seen already uh, since the, the, the 80s of the 14th century, is that the Italian states re made this effort to recruit mercenaries, especially Italian ones, right? Uh, but to keep this the, the, the tie with the military leaders hired more 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 stable more more c under control right so that's properly the moment that historiographically has been defined narrowly beginning as the, the condottieri one because from there on it was mostly as we've seen mostly an Italian thing an internal thing and a more much more mediated and organized thing than, than before and what I what is fascinating in this whole picture is that in, in these decades, Italy had passed fundamentally from a set of roughly 30 um, virtually independent, properly internationally speaking, uh, city-states to essentially a, a much, um, you know, uh, to, to this, the, the period of regional states that were essentially these major cities, Milan, Florence, and uh, Venice, that, that where the major powers had gradually incorporated, uh, were gradually incorporating the, you know, other cities that now were subject to their own control. So this goes in parallel properly with the mediation, the rationalization, uh, the normalization of the maintenance of a, of a kind of permanent army, as you understand, for some periods of time, right, with this very specific Italian bias that, yes, it is true, wasn't aiming at creating any uh, political or social class of, 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 of permanent military men within the state, for many reasons, right? Italy, first of all, was divided. They had a consistent infant, uh, amount of population, but this was not enough, considering also the fact that they were quite productively employed in lots of properly, you know, uh, economical in the economical system, so they, they, this, all this working force was not good for. Why they, would they have armed it, right? In Italy, like in Flanders, like in France with the Jacquerie, during the centuries there had been uh, revolts of the proletarians of the textile laborers because they were exploited and oppressed, and naturally they were put down without any mercy because they were uh, in those times from the losing side of history. Um, and um, so thinking about arming them, right, it would have been crazy. But properly, the peninsula was n was based on a city system. So in, in, even if though these cities could expand on other cities, they wouldn't actually have like a territorial national character. Like Italians actually understood they were Italians. This is quite interesting because they, they were divided they would remain as you know for a long time but you know when they were in Italy they were the Florentines the Milanese the Venetians whatever when they were abroad they felt Italian so there was an idea that they belonged objectively just by political or cultural socio-economical standards a, a, a unique exception here again this is the cradle of humanism it has a, drum, a very there is a very early state um, um, you know, building of, of you know, political theory in a statally oriented sense, etc. But yes, they are still divided, um, and therefore they cannot quite put too much mm, mass, too many masses of men drawn from the single city states to form what eventually the Swiss would have done, 
in the 15th century, like an entire people in arms, or at least a part of it that was properly paid by the world system. Here there is none of that. Right, so this short-term armies that are, you know, very competent, very professional, etc., but still employed for this kind of, you know, equilibrium, maintain this kind of equilibrium between these major powers never managed to take, take each other out, on the long run, up to throughout all this time, the, the 15th century, uh, is essentially the uh, what Italian states would remain um, until the Italian wars, right? When they the, the weakness of this system would be highlighted, right? Would, but also because of a political crisis, not because of uh, they lacked factually military force to oppose to foreign powers. It's just that they were chronically divided and incapable at that point of saying, okay, let's like let's make a broader alliance that is not just fictionally designed to maintain peace while you know trying to exploit any other situation even by calling foreign powers in let's create something that there was no uh, base for that right historically this was not a country like you say France was a kingdom it had these boundaries was built over time but it, it was that it was a major landmass um, with with a without single government, this wasn't anything like that. They were very rich individually, but they wouldn't have the same expendability of that wealth in political and uh, in political terms. They didn't want to arm masses. They didn't need that, right? They mostly wanted to accumulate wealth. Um, and mm, war costed indeed a lot, too much. There was no evident moment of pressure threat right at, especially at this point during the 14th century crisis where most european countries capabilities actually contracted on a on a local base so there was no major threat like i don't know at the time of barbarossa where the germans came wanting to literally sub subjugate everybody um so there was no reason even to you know try to alter dramatically the status quo within the same peninsula and they accommodated like that um, this is the most poignant, I would say, poignant um, consideration in, in a broader sense. I would like also to stress, given that I mostly deal with tactics, that um, the White Company that, as we've seen, was mostly composed of veterans of the Hundred Years' War and who fought with longbows in the same Italy, etc., wouldn't actually leave any trace in Italy in terms of any tactical innovation or capacity. And th this is a this is a very important point because uh, not just longbow as warfare as such, which, as you know, it's even incorrect to, to term it like that because it was still a part of a combined arms systems, is in a sense overrated. But properly, you can see it when it it was transferred in another system. It was actually military advance, and that wouldn't feel the need to 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 put this into practice in its own realm right the italians actually produced some of the finest bows at the time uh some of the, the best ones were the ones in lombardy because of different time of um you know the 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 um, temperature excursions in the region was you know tempered the, the, the wood in, in a very particular way they produced longbows. They produced longbows. They exported to England in, in Tuscany, in Lombardy, in fact, as we were saying. But they wouldn't use them in Italy. And this is the beauty, the Klaus of uh, idea. They wouldn't need that. They, their system worked well the way it did, right? And there is no way to compare the military systems because, you know, not only Italy didn't fight the Hundred Years' War, but also there was no no context there to to compare the two systems this is very very important also in historiographical perspective because it shows you sometimes how we we met we as we were saying at the very beginning of the video how we kind of give for granted things that shouldn't such as the fact that uh, a technology uh, makes tactics while it's notoriously the other way around uh, in the history of science or technology and the uh, in, in military history proper um, but it's meaningful because um, the different of course military systems are not really detached here at the point of you know these were different countries that wouldn't know how they fought 
more or less Europeans all knew how they fought, right? And there are some cultural, I mean, everything can be subjective in from the sources, right? You know, there are some, for example, Italian chroniclers are very interested in uh, some battles of the Hundred Years' War, as you know, Crecy was documented by Villani, by one of th the most important chroniclers in medieval Europe, that there was um, uh, a, a very interested attention towards even, for example, the revolt of the Flemish at the beginning of, this, uh, of the 14th century against the kingdom. But there is no, no um, sensationalization or teleological or progressistic approach to these things. Basically, they, they saw it as a sort of an accident because if you really look at what it was militarily wise such as in, in Flanders where yes they they scored Courtrai and then they they managed to do something at Moment Pavel that was a stall fundamentally but after that the Flemish armies f fundamentally wouldn't accomplish anything else I mean until Guinegat that was a, yet another stall uh, they they were defeated repeatedly in a way that it's almost like it, it's hard to see medieval history like such a repeated series of defeats. By the way, at the same hands of the, the, the French military culture that had been had suffered so much at Courtrai, that you start wondering, but you know, yes, did we get medieval warfare right? That is to say, the way we decided to look at history and for which reasons and which to highlight certain military realities rather than other, is it really Mo you know justified like is there like you can motivate it yes but is it good like heuristically speaking um is there really any point to it don't you think that we have mistaken something and unfortunately when national historiographies take it personally uh it, it's a bit difficult to do this because um it's a bit difficult in in i don't know in flemish historiography not to exalt the battle of Courtrai as it's a bit difficult in Italian historiography not to demonize the age of the three companies. Um, because there are some deeper cultural, um, national bias that, that, that until you, you, you correct with some, you know, broader scientific, you know, properly imbued understanding of, of that phase of history, they do not quite pass. The same goes with the longbow, right? The idea that this was somewhat a magic weapon that, you know, without which the, the, the English could have not achieve their victories. This, this is doubtful in a way because the, the English success again is not a matter of tactical um, of, of let's say of which weapons you use right it's a matter of properly the fact that England had a dramatic leadership in a hell of a state for for 14th century standards uh, without the victories on in France the English state would have easily collapsed during the 14th century uh, there was there properly a vision that, Clausewitzianly speaking, the the you, you cannot measure on a weapon, on a, or even on a tactic, or even on a battlefield. It has to do with the political and social background, right? And so it's all the more meaningful that the English were, for example, the most successful mercenaries among the uh, free companies in 14th century Italy that were so um, effective. Um, organized kind of cohesive, right it's not an exception right but also at the same time you see here that they pass without leaving tr sensible trace uh because there is not uh i studied this this aspect too at some point and and so it, it, it's the same the as we were saying before the catalan infantry basically the italians dismiss it from literally i think literally one year to another because they don't want to use them anymore. They just want the French and the, and, and the German knights. And weren't the, the Amogalvaris, the ones that, that defeated French cavalry at, at Cephissus in Greece, one of the, the, the most, you know, spec I wouldn't say spectacular if we're talking about anything but like that to, to emphasize the, the exceptionality of that victory. It was remarkable, truly remarkable especially considering that we're largely a light infantry in a sense. Uh, terrain did help, but if you don't hold, uh, you can't do well. That was successful there, but it wasn't successful, apparently, in Italy. That also, in a broader sense, in this time, wasn't quite, you know, studied abroad either, because 
they wouldn't see again they would people would fixate on single infantry victories as if fighting just with infantry was the uh, you know the indicator of some sort of advanced military culture it wasn't at all right and it, it it's not important that infantry was the future because in 200 years it would have become that under completely different political and social circumstances uh, if you study how Flemish armies were organized um, compared to the Italian ones in the early 14th century, but we are l light of years separated. But you can see it even from the chronicles. Right? When you read a Flemish chronicle of, of the early 14th century, or an Italian one of the early 14th century, the, 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 the first one seems like 100 years before. Uh, it there are certain stages of development that are um, are co have been completely ignored in in European culture for reasons that it's not m the point now to discuss. But you know that, that that you understand how easy they are to misconceive in a way. And this has nothing to do, however, with um, with importance of this phenomenon. I, I, I will not never doubt that. You know, the, the Battle of Courtrai. It doesn't matter how important other battles or other armies of the time were. It, it, it's definitely the single. Mo it's truly the single most impacting battle, probably. Mm, surely not of the Middle Ages, but I mean, you know, in the realm of those years, like mostly in the 14th century, for, for this series of battles that were scored, it was the first one actually. It's a, the, the the path opener in general, in, for the next 50 years. That was literally mind blowing, a world upside down. In fact. You know, if you read the various sources and say, this is a miracle, how, how the hell did they do? Because nobody gave the Flemish a damn. They called them butter rabbits. And they wondered how they could slaughter the flower of the most powerful cavalry in Europe. And, 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 and you can't reconcile with that. So, but, but it's important to, you see, if you love the Flemish military and Flemish history, etc. At that point, you cannot separate this magnitude um, event from, in, in terms of moral impact from the fact that the Flemish, in that sense, didn't have any magic or special capacity from a military point of view. They were just very much determined and motivated because they had moral forces from their side. They wouldn't win their battle because they had good and that they, they wouldn't even call like that where they they the pin the staff at most um, or anything else. It's because they stood their ground to win or die, which is the only thing that consistently makes a difference uh, in relative terms in, in in such situations, right? But this has nothing to do with the fact that, of course, the French military system was a dramatically more advanced one and kept scoring victories for hundreds of years, while the Flemish wouldn't wouldn't do it any of that. And it's, and so th this is even more remarkable, and it should make you understand even more seriously how important it is to to study history in a proper sense, because it's too f facile, too easy to 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 buy, let's say, the the myth that of course, okay, you know, it's it's a di dichotomy. If I win, I'm just, you know, it, it, it's. You have to be the best. It's as if I'm saying that, you know, since the Taliban won in Afghanistan, but no, I don't want to compare absolutely, there's no comparison in sense, but you understand what I mean. Or the, the, the Viet Cong in Vietnam, therefore, you know, that's better, that's stronger, that's cooler than, in this case, the United States. But it has literally nothing, but not even possibly or remotely anything to do with that. But many people use that to of course in ideological ways and that that's what we have to cope with today that the fact that we have built our historiography on an ideological base even when we actually knew the facts which naturally is even worse but it's even easier to to fix because you know it, it's better to know how things went like at that point you can really more, more you can feel more empowered about your past because you actually don't have to tell you know fairy tales really but to objectivize the quality of them. And naturally, if people don't study the art of war, or can't even distinguish it from military history as such, and, and then they don't have any specific strategic culture, and they don't, they don't study campaigns or battles for a lifetime, or have a diachronic and comparative military historical education. This is not possible, but together with this, also being a, a, 
a functional country to have a civic, or, uh, civic education, democratic culture, and a, a strategic capacity is not possible because you cannot go out there in the world owning political, hence also military power, in pretending that you can use it if you don't even study military history or if you neglect von Clausewitz, you think you can equate it to Sun Tzu or, or other you know, amenities of this kind. Unfortunately, we live in a world like this and we pay for it and we'll keep paying for it. Right. Anyhow, um, for now, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.